Hello, welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto. Today we're going to talk about Jerry Seinfeld and his Porsche problems. Jerry Seinfeld was in the news recently because of a Porsche that he consigned at an auction in Florida was purchased by somebody for a lot of money. And it turns out that the Porsche might not be what it was purported to be in the auction. So this is uh, one of these things that's uh, kind of embarrassing if you're a famous person like Jerry Seinfeld. Well known for his Porsche collection, by the way. But I get, apparently he spun a bunch of those cars off and sold them at this auction. And uh, the one that's in, uh, in question here is a 1958 Porsche 356 Speedster, which sold with a hammer price of $1.54 million and was represented as being uh, one of fewer than 60 aluminum-bodied four-cam Speedster GS GT models ever built, okay? I will admit, I know what some of those things mean, <laughs> but I'm not a big Porsche freak, so... It means more to other people. I never would have guessed a car like that's worth 1.5, but then again, I'm not a Porsche guy. Uh, uh, a buyer with uh, an unusual name because it's a, it's a business, uh, it's a corporation, it's an LTD, named Fika Frio uh, is the buyer. And uh, this is interesting in and of itself. But they claim that after they bought the Porsche, based on representations made by Seinfeld himself through the auction service, uh, they, they discovered the car was not what it was purported to be, and they then asked Jerry if he'd buy the vehicle back, and they claimed they had some negotiations back and forth, and those negotiations fell apart so that the company then had to file a lawsuit against Jerry Seinfeld. And now, the lawsuit is available online, and I found it several different places. I will admit I'm reading it to you off the New York Post, but this is the actual lawsuit. So I know people say, hey, Steve, how, how can you... How can you read somebody like the New York Post. It's the lawsuit. It's the lawsuit. I'm looking at the actual complaint filed in the United States District Court, Southern District of New York, Fika Frio Limited Plaintiff versus Jerry Seinfeld, defendant. And Fika Frio Limited uh, is the buyer, uh, and they're represented by attorneys, and they filed a lawsuit against defendant Jerry Seinfeld or Mr. Seinfeld, or defendant or the seller, uh, in the lawsuit. And, and here's the story. And again, I'm going to go over this legally because I am an attorney. I do a lot of automobile law. I filed so many lawsuits that contain the names buyer, seller, dealer, manufacturer, and so on, that this is very, very uh, comfortable uh, reading for me. But it might not be for you, so I'll try to clean it up a little bit. <clears throat> but in March of 2016, at an auction held by Gooding & Company, uh, at which Mr. Seinfeld and Fika Frio's representatives attended in person in Amelia Island, Florida, uh, Fika Frio purchased the purported 1958 Porsche 356A 1500 GS slash GT Carrera Speedster, here and after referred to as the vehicle, from Mr. Seinfeld for $1.54 million. Uh, the vehicle is not authentic and not the automobile Mr. Seinfeld represented, according to the allegations in the complaint. So I'm just reading the complaint to you. I'm not saying it's not real. I don't know. I haven't seen the car. <laughs> I've seen pictures of it. It looks like an interesting car. Um, and uh, based on information and belief and representations, the plaintiff argues that Mr. Seinfeld provided to Gooding and was approved and or ratified by Mr. Seinfeld that information would be distributed to auction attendees and potential bidders. And so, so what they're saying is, look, we went to an auction. Cars being sold by Jerry Seinfeld. The auctioner, of course, is the person who stands up with their hammer and gavel and, and, and talks real fast and tries to get people to bid, but the actual seller of the car is Jerry Seinfeld. It's, it's an auctioneer who's in the middle, but the question is, did Mr. Seinfeld make representations about the car? Are those representations actionable if, in fact, they turned out to be false? And so they say that these documents that were distributed along with the other things that happened at the auction uh, describe the vehicle as a 1958 Porsche 356A 1500 GS slash GT Carrera Speedster from the Jerry Seinfeld collection. I'm not sure why that's that important, but I guess they think that kind of pedigree might add some value to the uh, car. And they say that uh, also it said it had the distinction of being the only Carrera Speedster known to have been finished at the factory in Auratium Green. Auratium Green. A-U-R-A-T-I-U-M. Oratium Green. You gotta love how car companies <laughs> can come up with great sounding names for colors. It's green. No, no, no. It's Oratium Green. Uh, it was also alleged to be one of only 56 Carrera Speedsters specified in the GSGT trim that left the factory with lightweight aluminum panels 
And, quote, this exceptionally rare 1500 GS GT Carrera Speedster is surely among the finest restored examples of a highly sought after four cam Porsche. This thing's got four cams. Uh, the vehicle summary provided at the auction further stated the vehicle was acquired by Jerry Seinfeld in late 2012 and had been a prized fixture in the collection ever since. Now, the funny thing is, whether those statements are true or false, you know, easy enough to figure out when he got the car. It's a question is, like, is it actionable or not? I don't know. Uh, they, they may be putting in a lot of stuff here that might not be necessary. But the buyer claims that on the basis of these and other representations and justifiably believing the vehicle to be authentic, as represented by Mr. Seinfeld, Fika Frio purchased the vehicle at the auction for $1.54 million, and they allege the vehicle is not authentic and is not the automobile that Mr. Seinfeld and the vehicle summary provided at the auction represented. So they got a car, but they're saying it's not the car uh, as described in the sense that uh, the car they got doesn't meet these descriptions. Uh, they claim that um, when Fika Frio figured out that the thing was not authentic, they notified Mr. Seinfeld, who they claim left a voicemail audio recording to their uh, representatives offering to rescind the sale and return Fika Frio the purchase price, but then that never happened. So that's part of the lawsuit as well. So in the lawsuit, Fika Frio is asking the court to order the buyback, that is, make Mr. Seinfeld return the money to them that they paid along with some other damages. But as I pointed out earlier, Fika Frio Limited is a, a, an entity. They are, and I'm, make, I'm not making this up, they are a bailiwick of Jersey <laughs> with its principal place of business at 26 New Street, St. Helier, Jersey, in the Channel Islands. JE23RA, in case you want to write to them. So they are a bailiwick of Jersey. Uh, what that is... It's a legal entity of some sort. Mr. Seinfeld is an individual and a citizen of the United States and a resident of New York. Hence, the case was filed in the district court in New York. And many of these um, facts get restated several times throughout the complaint, which is fairly common. So the main thing we're looking at is whether or not these statements that, that were made in connection with the sale of this Porsche, uh, whether they are the kinds of statements that are objective in nature enough to be measured as true or false. So they simply said, hey, it's a great car. It's a rare car. It's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a great looking car. This car has been taken very well care of. It's been well maintained. Those kinds of things are hard to measure. But the vehicle summary says things that are measurable. And it says, for instance, that between 55 and 59, Porsche built 151 Carrera Speedsters a figure that accounts for just 3% of the total Speedster production. From this limited supply, fewer than 90 Carrera Speedsters were specified in GSGT trim, and even fewer, approximately 56 now, left the factory with lightweight aluminum panels. For decades, knowledgeable Porsche collectors have regarded these limited production alloy-paneled GSGT Speedsters as the ultimate expression of the sporting 356. The few examples that survive today are jealously guarded by their owners, and the Carrera Speedster presented here, chassis 84908, is a stunning example of a rare thoroughbred Porsche. According to factory records, this car was completed in May of 58 and specified as a GSGT with alloy panels. Those are all things that are true or false. Was it built at the factory with aluminum panels? Yes or no? That's pretty simple. Um... And is this one of the approximately 56 cars? And the use of the word approximately there wouldn't kill you on that uh, because the, the, the point is that there's a limited number. We know it's a limited number, and, and they're claiming ours is amongst that limited number. So the argument's not about the size of the limit. It's more about are you in that group? Um, in a, and this is another statement. In addition to its rare mechanical specifications, 84908 has the distinction of being the only Carrera Speedster known to have been finished at the factory in a ratio green. So, they're making two statements there. They're saying this car came from the factory in this oddball color, and it's the only one. So, if there was more than one, that statement might not be true. It wouldn't be true. And if it didn't come from the factory in that color, the statement also would not be true. Um, likewise, there's a statement that says the vehicle was acquired by Jerry Seinfeld in late 2012, and has been a prized fixture in his collection ever since. Eh, you know, if it was in his collection, does it add value? Possibly. Somewhere down the road might say, hey, by the way, I've got that Seinfeld Oratium Green Speedster. 
that might mean something. I don't know how much value that adds, but apparently they, they think it's valuable enough to include it in the lawsuit. And then they're saying that uh, the vehicle summary also stated things such as, this exceptionally rare 1500 GSGT Carrera Speedster is surely among the finest restored examples of a highly sought after four cam Porsche. Again, none of that's measurable. I mean, is it exceptionally rare versus rare? Is it among the finest? Who knows? Eligible for numerous international events, equipped with the most desirable factory specifications, and beautifully presented following an exacting restoration by Mark Specialist, European Collectibles, this Carrera Speedster will appeal to the collector who demands only the very best. I would argue that almost all of that's puffery, meaning that you can't argue about whether or not it is appealing to a collector who demands only the very best. How would you measure that? Okay, so that wouldn't do it. But it's it's the more specif you know, the more specificity regarding things like it's the only one that came from this fact in this color. It it came with these special body panels, you know, and those things that are that are probably going to be actionable here. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff in here about how the auction went down. Apparently, Mr. Seinfeld was there along with some of his friends who spoke at length to the audience about the cars on the auction block. Uh, and they actually make an argument here that one of the reasons the defendants, uh, the defendant was so willing to buy this car was based on the personal representations that Mr. Seinfeld made about the car at the auction. Again, you know, I'm not sure how actionable that stuff is, but... They did say that it was stated that this is an authentic 1958 Porsche 356A 1500 GSGT Carrera Speedster. And all of those things are measurable. So, for instance, let's suppose it's actually a 1959. Well, that would be a, a false statement. Let's suppose instead of being a 356A, it was some other thing. I, I don't know enough about Porsches to know what, you know what the other thing would be. Let's suppose it was a... 1958 Porsche 356A 1500, but it didn't have the GSGT specification from the factory. That would be false. So each of those things is measurable. If it turned out to be false, could be a problem. And so now you ask yourself, what causes of action, what laws do you allege were broken when you go to an auction and you buy something that's represented as one thing if it turns out to not be that thing? And again, keep in mind that it's possible that all of these allegations are incorrect and the, and the vehicle is exactly as represented and that Seinfeld did nothing wrong, and that the buyer is merely wrong. That's possible. Okay, that's what courts are for. I'm talking about the allegations. So the first claim is for negligent misrepresentation. And they're basically saying that, look, the people who sold us the vehicle made representations about the vehicle that were false. And whether they knew them or not as being false, they made them negligently. They had a duty to know what they were talking about. And instead of doing their duty and only saying what they knew to be true, they said things that weren't true, and therefore, they're liable for it. And so they go on and on about this in here, about how Seinfeld represented this thing as being authentic, and he might not have actually known. And they do talk about how when Seinfeld bought the car from some previously, he bought it through a broker, and allegedly the broker wouldn't tell him who he got it from. So they can't even check the pedigree that way. So they raise that and they say, look, if the vehicle's not authentic, and he presented it as being authentic, he had a duty to know whether or not he knew what he's talking about. So therefore, he's, he's potentially liable for negligent misrepresentation. But just in case they have a claim here for intentional misrepresentation. And they say that many of the facts that were stated as being true about this car are not true. And they are claiming in their lawsuit that Seinfeld knew that. It's very, very difficult to prove a mental state. This might be the hardest thing for them to prove in this case. So we'll see how that shakes out. Uh, another cause of action down here is mutual mistake. And that's an interesting one because that's contract 101. And that is if you and I enter into a contract where I say I agree to the contract and you say you agree to the contract, and then later on people approach that and view it and go, wait a second, you guys were both talking about different things. You guys weren't even talking about the same thing. Then that's called a mutual mistake, and I'm glossing over that. I, I apologize, all you contract attorneys out there. There's some famous cases on mutual mistake. I'm not going to go into them. But the thinking here is, hey, if Seinfeld believed it was real, and we believed it was real, and it turns out it wasn't real, but the contract called for it to be real, isn't that a mutual mistake? In other words, he's mistaken in believing it was real. We're mistaken in believing it was real. And both of us are innocent. Do we still have to go through the contract? So that's mutual mistake right there. They're basically saying it's possible that no one's wrong. But still, we shouldn't get stuck with this fake car if, in fact, it's fake. They claim there's a cause of action for breach of an oral agreement. And they're saying that when Seinfeld made the promise on the 
answering machine, he should be held to that. Uh, that's going to be a stretch also only because I'm not sure how enforceable an oral agreement like that is in New York where this is being litigated. Uh, but there's a big problem there because it's kind of hard to call it a contract or something like that because if I make a statement, how, you know, how can I know someone agreed to it or not before they've even heard it? So I won't go there. But the more important thing here is the thing I have to talk about, the fifth claim is for breach of express warranty. And like I said, every single one of those objective statements made about the car that describe the car in some detail or way that can be measured, the year of the car, the make of the car, the model of the car, the sub-model of the car, the type of car, all of these things that they go into calling it what it is, those are all warranties. So it's a 1958 Porsche 356A, 1500 GSGT Carrera Speedster. If any of those words are incorrect, any of them, or the numbers are incorrect, that would be a breach of warranty. That's a straight UCC claim, and that's going to be the same pretty much in all 50 states. And on a breach of warranty claim, you've got several options. One of which is you can sue for damages, meaning that the vehicle, if it's not a real GSGT, but it is everything else, is worth less money, so at least I should get that money back. But the other argument is I'm trying to buy this very, very specific thing. You made all these warranties about it. If the warranties aren't true, you've breached the warranty, then I didn't get what I bargained for. One of my remedies is I don't want it anymore because it's not what I bargained for. I'm going to give it back to you. Revocation of acceptance or rescission of the contract depends on how you want to how you want to call it. But the interesting thing is that when you look at the prayer for relief, that is what the parties are looking, the plaintiffs looking for, entry of judgment in Fika Frio's favor against Seinfeld and rescinding the vehicle sale, which is like we said, revocation of acceptance or rescinding the contract, or they're asking in the alternative, entry of judgment in Fika Frio's favor uh, for all. Uh, fees, costs, expenses, damages, including the purchase price and associated costs, in an amount to be determined at trial, and in the alternative, judgment, fika for your favor, again, Seinfeld for specific performance, performance to force them to go through the oral agreement, uh, and then they also are seeking for punitive and exemplary damages, which are what they're looking for in those tort claims, the misrepresentation and so on, that's why you throw those in there. Uh, and they say grant such other relief and further relief as this court deems fair and equitable, and the one thing I noticed that the law firm did not ask for was attorney fees. Uh, interesting, um, because <laughs> it might be that on a $1.5 million car, you don't care so much about the attorney fees, but on the other hand, some states will allow you to ask for them as consequential damages. But then again, I'm not their attorney, so it's not my job to advise them. So that's the lawsuit that was filed against Jerry Seinfeld last week. It's a lawsuit. It's allegations. We don't know if any of it's true. We just know those are the allegations. I will follow this case, and when there are updates of significance, I will do updates in this video. Otherwise, questions or comments? Fire my way. Talk to you later.